Is crypto gaming ready to onboard the next billion on chain? In March, the crypto gaming market hit all time highs in traffic. Pixels, the leading crypto game, had 60 million visits to their website in March alone and over 1.6 million monthly active accounts. And we're still early in the bull run. I mean, retail is very quiet. Our spidey senses are tingling over at Milk Road. The milkman is feeling good about Web3 Gaming, and we want to make sure you're informed and ready to capitalize. So today, we're joined by Luke Barakowski, founder and CEO of Pixels, which is the largest Web3 game by daily active users. In today's fascinating interview, we discuss the Web3 growth engine that enables game creators to create new forms of incentive design and user acquisition through token distribution, why Pixels moved from Polygon to Ronin and the impact of that decision, the current state of Pixels tokenomics. Last month, they distributed 17 million tokens and had about 8 million locked up. So there's a 9 million gap that Luke and his team are working to close in order to build a sustainable token. And Luke's big bet on play to earn and the future of gaming, which might come sooner than most people realize. GMGM, GM, welcome to Milk Road Radio, the easiest path to get smarter about crypto. I'm Jay Hamilton, your host, and I believe that on-chain is the next online. This is the opportunity, and we're here to guide you to capitalize on it. GMGM, GM, Luke, welcome to Milk Road Radio. Thanks for having me, man. Super stoked to have you, bro. A, very excited because Pixels is just one of the leading games on-chain, and also gaming is finally maybe having its moment we're seeing all-time highs across web3 gaming obviously in line with the whole crypto market on the rise i want to start with i heard you say on a uh, an interview recently that building a web3 game is 40 percent the game and 60 percent everything else what is that like to be trying to build something where only 40 percent of what you're doing is really your game and the everything else and what are those everything else yeah, I mean, I take a look at a lot of the Web2 giants in the space right now. And it's funny because some people might not even know the company names of these Web2 giants. But it's like Scopely is kind of the one that's really been like attracting my attention lately. They built the game Monopoly Go. Monopoly Go has made something like $2 billion in revenue in the last like 10 months. Something insane like that. Like people don't understand how big this company is and how well it's monetizing. And Scopely, what they're famous for is getting extremely data-driven on how they develop games and how they build them, how they do user acquisition, and how they do monetization. And that growth engine is why they're so competitive. You play Monopoly Go, I'm not going to say it's a bad game. It's a good game, but it's like it's not that crazy, right? It's Monopoly in like a more casual setting mm-hmm. at the end of the day, right? And what I see in Web3 gaming a lot of the times is people really overcomplicate games. They're, make, they're very ambitious, right? Web3 is an interesting spot because some people were building out Web3 games because it was easier to fundraise for the dream game they wanted to build. Right. But what I'm most interested in Web3 gaming is how you can use Web3 to grow games in new ways that you couldn't do in Web2. Mm-hmm. So I love games. I grew up playing RuneScape. But my interest inside of this space really lie in a new form of game monetization, a new form of gaming user acquisition that's just not possible inside of Web2 gaming. So that's a lot of the stuff that we've been experimenting with. And also to other people building out Web3 games, getting a Web3 game out and running, that's a great accomplishment. All the stuff after you have a live Web3 game is insane. <laughs> what you have to do with Web3 live ops, it's 10x harder in basically every single category. Because when there starts to create, we have incentive structures inside of the ecosystem, people are going to try to break it. So if you build a nice little farming game inside of Web2, you're probably not going to have people trying to hack it. You're not going to have people trying to break it every single day. You're not going to have people trying to like break any incentive structure you have, bought the game, all of this kind of stuff too. So Building with your game, it also brings on a lot of new responsibilities that you don't necessarily normally deal with inside of Web 2. Mm-hmm. And it creates a lot of other challenges too. But it's fun because once you start to crack these, you see some really interesting new growth channels that are highly competitive against Web 2 games. Like really what our goal here at Pixels is to completely disrupt the free-to-play gaming industry. We think there's a really interesting opportunity for a gaming company to come in with this new type of user acquisition model that doesn't exist inside of Web2. It's actually like hyper competitive against Web2. And there's a chance to take a lot of market share away from these free-to-play companies, or at least build out the next generation of what gaming looks like. You know, 
gaming is an evolution from going to arcades to like purchasing consoles at your home, buying mm-hmm. games, then mobile and free to play. And we think this is the next iteration of that. Play to earn. It's a dirty word, but we love it. And we think that there's a huge future in it. And we think it's going to be the future of you know how games actually acquire users. I love what you focus on user acquisition as the big opportunity with on-chain. I just want to talk quickly though, like, is the struggle worth it? I, and I know the answer already, obviously, but you bring up a lot of points, right? Like this is not easy in comparison to there's a much easier path. If you're a gaming company, you go build a web two game and you don't think about tokenomics and you don't think about regulation and you don't think about getting hacked and all this value creation and how you manage that and how you keep your community safe and yada, 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 yada. So do you feel like it's worth it? It's really interesting to me and I love how hard it is. And that's why I'm building in the space. I could have been doing a lot of things with my life. Mm. And I like to be in this space because of how challenging it is and because of how much it pushes me. Now, this is not a space for the weak hearted because it's really easy to get torn down. And there are insane challenges that happen on like a weekly cadence. I've gotten to the point where I just laugh whenever there's this like crazy black swan event because it happens so often now where it's not even like a stressor to me. It's just like, okay, that's what we're dealing with this week. We'll have something probably just as crazy next week too. But yeah, there'll be some fun stories to tell in a couple of years because the stuff that you deal with in this space is insane. But yeah, that's part of the fun too. That's why it's interesting for me in particular to be building here too because because of how hard it is to build, there's so much blue ocean in front of us. You'll also run into a lot of things inside of the space where you're like, wow, I was somebody not built some of this stuff yet. It's one of the spaces where you still have to build a lot of your own tech and infrastructure. But because of this also, it's again, like total green field where there's no playbook. There's no rules besides all the rules, <laughs> um, but besides all the on-chain rules or the yeah. lack of on-chain rules and regulation right now. Like when it comes to actually like figuring out how you make it in this world, there really is no playbook or rules to that. And that's the fun thing to me. When you start to like, if you were to build a web two game company, it's in a really interesting spot right now where, you know, you have to compete with like the likes of Scopely or Zynga who are masters at performance marketing and monetization side of games. Like their games are honestly just math equations at this point. Their games, like they have people that love working on games, other companies, but like on the top exec level, it's literally just numbers to them. And, you know, there's no harder soul or fun than that, right? So we're in a spot where it's crazy. It's really hard and challenging, but there's a lot of fun in it for that reason. Let's talk about the growth engine because we kind of keep coming back to that being one of the main differences between a Web 2 game versus a Web 3 game is the growth engine that blockchain enables, the incentive structures that it enables, the user acquisition platforms or playbook that it, that it enables that really don't exist in Web2. Can you talk to us about how you guys at Pixels think about that growth engine and maybe compare it to Web2 if you'd like? Yeah. So how Web2 games tend to grow is they tend to do performance marketing. What they'll do is they'll get a pretty good idea on the top level of who they want to advertise to based on you know different research that they've done about their game. Like you know they come in with this idea like we're building this game for moms in the U.S. and you know they'll start running ads targeting these types of people and then they'll basically fine tune every single funnel from when you first see the ad to like sending it to you again to when you click on the ad, open the game, and then all the way to when you finally spend money inside of the game. And that is a lot of the work that these companies have been putting in for the last 10 years, essentially becoming masters of fine-tuning these strategies. And Web3 is interesting because our thesis here at Pixels is that it grows in the complete opposite way. Mm-hmm. Rather than a top-down approach like performance marketing, really it's a bottoms-up approach where you build with community and you find ways to help your community help you grow. And that's where, for us, the token comes into play. Really how we like to view tokens is more like a user acquisition budget that we get every single month. And our goal with the token is to basically find the best users inside of our ecosystem who we think are going to help the ecosystem grow in the most positive outcome. And for us, when we think about positive outcome, we think about you know traditional gaming metrics, we think about monetization inside of the game, we think about daily active users, we think about retention. But really, it's our job to kind of figure out what to do with all these tokens and how to create the best outcome with these tokens. So there's a lot of depth and nuance that comes with that. Essentially, you almost have to do like performance marketing on your own users 
that's why we call the bottom up approach instead, where what we have to do is we have to actually have a very deep understanding of who our best users are and mm-hmm. who we should be giving rewards to. Because if you just give like a flat reward structure, this is when all the Web3 you know, troubles start to come in, where you'll start to get people attacking it, botting it, cyber attackers, or you'll just get like a group of users who don't actually care about your game. Even if you were like do 100% bot prevention detection and you just had like not very smart incentive design, you'd get like a pretty unhappy group of users who are just coming to the game to extract and leave and no one leaves in a good position that way. So mm-hmm. what we like to do is we like to do a lot of the work of like actually finding out who likes our game and who gets enjoyment out of our game. And then that's the kind of music that we actually want to be rewarding. And we want to create kind of incentive structures to help you go and progress through this journey as well too. Like for example, you, know, you might not have checked out our game initially, but you know maybe a little incentive to like start playing is what you needed to like get into the game to start liking it. So that's how we do a lot of this tech. And there's so much depth and nuance there when it comes to actually figuring out user identification, the segmentation, mm-hmm. what rewards to get people, like the right ratio of rewards to get different types of people. But that's kind of the tech that we're building out. That's when I talk about growth engine, that's what we're thinking about. I love how you think about the approach it from a, a standard business mindset, which is, okay, this is an expense to the business. User acquisition always is. And typically that expense in a web two game or in a traditional casual game goes into performance marketing, like you said, and you have you know, a CMO who has a CAC and it's just like, hey, here's here's your CAC and here's who you're targeting and just pump it out and then raise a whole bunch of capital in order to do that because you have to grow really fast. And obviously what comes along with raising capital and investors and now you're even going more into sort of pushing away from being part of your community and you're building for the most profit as quick as possible, you know, build it up, IPO or sell it. So it does this model it makes a difference not just in how you're thinking about this expense being a user acquisition expense in terms of the token. It also makes a difference on the way you build your company and build your game. I know you talk lots about building in public and building with the community. How have you guys gone about that? How do you think about that? Yeah, because Web3 is in such an interesting spot where nobody really knows what's going to work still. Nobody knows the type of gameplay that works best in Web3. Nobody knows what the features in Web3 are that like actually make sense. We have taken a build and public approach. So we've released a game much earlier than any Web2 developer would ever release a game. And we released it to our community. And we started off with a pretty bad version of the game. But with our community, the game has gotten better and better. So we spent like two over two years of this now, where we've been basically doing updates every single week, getting feedback from the community and kind of learning and understanding what kind of features they like, what kind of features they don't. And it's been us experimenting and iterating a ton too. So we have not built like traditional game studio. We built a lot more like a startup would combined with the game studio model. And for us, it's worked. I don't think this is a process that works for everybody. Mm-hmm. This is what's worked for us. It's not easy at times because sometimes we release something and it doesn't work and then it's not always the best community sentiment but that's also for us the journey that we think that we need to go on to actually figure out like what in web3 actually makes sense like what needs to be on chain or off chain like what features in web3 actually provide more value to the users versus are just kind of vaporware you don't really know these things until you go out and try them so yeah we've been taking a lot of risk with this kind of stuff but it's paid off in our mind because we've gotten a way faster speed of iteration we've learned a ton of lessons and the product is in a lot better of a spot because of that. So there's still a really long way to go. If you come and join Pixels like after this, watching this, you'll still see that it still feels a little early stage. But that's mm. for us, all right, because yeah, you know, we have an end vision to all of this. But it's also kind of a living, breathing thing that the community gets to build with us too. So yeah, there's all sorts of benefits to that, not just beyond like speed of iteration, but also like we literally have users that have been playing this game for two years, almost every single day. And they've kind of gotten to like be a part of the game development too. And that adds a really interesting part to the whole mechanic or the whole component with us and our community as well, where our users are actually like a very active part of the development. They feel like they help us make decisions because they really do. Mm -hmm. And it adds like a really cool dynamic to the whole game Mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definitely a difference that I think, quite frankly, I think the whole world is missing this right now is the power of ownership it changes the goodwill that you have towards a brand. You really do approach it differently. You're not just, because we're all community members of brands. Any brand that you buy, you're 
technically a community member of that. You might follow them. You might, you know, subscribe to their email list or something like that. But it doesn't mean that you feel like an owner, maybe in the same way that a stockholder would, although it's slightly different. But this idea is something that I think it's so powerful if you can harness the community right. The challenging part is, as you said, it doesn't work for everybody because it's a lot more work when you're building with the community. You have to build the systems and the structures to communicate with them, to participate in that. And that often buries companies because they're like, oh gosh, I can't, I can't handle it. Especially when every day on Twitter, there's, you know, every time you put out a tweet, how many people are bashing you and saying something completely out of left field that has nothing to do with your tweet, but they're just an angry community member who has a bone to pick with you or something like that. Like it's a, it comes back to sort of what we started at. It is a lot more work, but the struggle can be worth it. Anyways, I'm curious, you mentioned play to earn is a a dirty word, but you talk about, you know, you have a vision for pixels and where you're going. How does play to earn fit into that vision? What is the vision? And maybe if you could reframe our view of play to earn. Maybe a lot of us are seeing it as a dirty thing because of some past projects that have made it so, but it, I don't think it needs to be. So maybe help us reframe and understand the way you think about play to earn. Yeah. I think honestly, our framing lately is I think we want to be the play to earn company because we think there's a ton of potential there. Yeah. But what we like to think about a lot is it's really easy to criticize somebody who came before you before you actually go and step in their shoes and build something yourself. And Play to Earn was one of those things that was popularized for us from like the first generation of Web3 gaming, essentially. And yeah, the first iteration of it didn't really work out. So then I think there was this shift in the space for a long time where people just assumed, you know, people tried it, it'll never come to fruition. It was a nice experiment. Now we'll move on. But instead, we kind of approached it as, okay, well, yeah, that iteration of play to earn didn't work, but is there a way that it could? Mm-hmm. And what does it look like if it does work? So the core thesis here is Web2 companies, they spend tens of millions of dollars a month on user acquisition. If we don't need to spend that money on user acquisition, and instead we figure out a different way to reward users or get users mm-hmm. inside of our ecosystem, why can't we give out some of the uh, like user acquisition power that we would have mm-hmm. back to our users? And if we do do that, is there a way that actually makes this still sustainable in the long run as well? So what we think about a lot when we think about the sustainability of play to earn is you know, you still need, in the long run, that ecosystem spend. You need to make a game that people want to pay money for to play, just like you would build a free-to-play game that some people want to pay to. It's optional. In any free-to-play game, it's optional, right? Mm-hmm. But some people actually do enjoy putting their time and their money into a game rather than like all of your time, sorry. Mm-hmm. And that's an option for people in our ecosystem too in the long run as well. So instead of us going and paying all this money to acquire free-to-play users, because typically in like a game economy or like a game like this, not all of your users monetize, only about like two to 5% in a free-to-play game typically monetize. But the rest of the users inside of that ecosystem are actually still valuable users. Typically, players monetize inside of a game because there's some element of, like competition amongst other users that they want to get an edge on or they want to like get some social status, things like this. So these other players inside of the ecosystem are actually completely necessary for these other players who want to monetize to actually monetize inside of the ecosystem. So we think about, about basically creating systems that kind of reward both of these types of users and create funnels to both of these users too. And the other thing that we like to think about a lot too and stuff that we're about to start implementing is essentially rewards for getting further and further through the game. Sometimes, you know, you just need like a little push to get to that next part of game progression where it unlocks a lot more gameplay, your game experience is better. And having like a little carrot on the end of a stick in front of you to actually like get to that next level, get to that next milestone, you know, that might actually lead to higher conversion rates in the long run for some of the things that we're trying to implement too. And there's this whole other really interesting side of things we can start to do with um, like incentivized app installs, things like this too. We give out like a little bit of a token incentive to go install like a new casual game that we were to create, for example. We have like really great distribution of funnels where you could pretty easily do that in the future as well. It opens up a ton of options. And then all of this is at no direct cost. Not mm-hmm. in the company because it's through you know, token incentives. So that's cool unlock with all of this. Super cool. Can you take us through what's the traditional onboarding you've got 
I think you had 16 million users in March, visits in March. Is that correct? 1.6 million? Yeah, like top level domain. Like if you were to like Google Pixels and you go to like pixels.xyz, there were 16 yeah. million visits to that website. We converted about like 10% of those into like monthly users. Okay. And then we monetized about like 10% of that. So there's 160,000 active VIP members. So these VIP members are paying about like 10 US dollars in Pixel a month for this membership into the game. Okay. It locks extra perks inside of the game. And yeah, we're about to start experimenting with even gaining some of the earnings behind this VIP battle pass as well too. But yeah, overall the user base is like quite healthy right now. This is an exciting spot to be in. And, and it's amazing, incredible numbers that you guys have achieved. Shout out to you and your whole team. What are you seeing? Is the typical journey that most people come in with the mindset of, oh, I'm going to make some pixel here and that's why I'm playing? Like, Do they come in with that earn mindset? So they're coming because they're getting an incentive. What is that incentive look like? Or are most people coming because they're like, hey, this looks like a cool, fun game. I just want to play it. What's the typical user journey? Yeah, there's a whole host of different users inside of the ecosystem. And that's a lot of what we're thinking about when we think about creating incentive structures, because mm. there's different types of users that play different roles inside of the ecosystem. And too much of one persona is never good. If you only had a game of whales, you only created incentives to bring in whales. You'd maybe have like a 10,000 DAU game. It's not a very exciting ecosystem and probably like caps out. If you only create incentives for free to play players, the game doesn't monetize. If you only create incentives for play to earn players, players who just have the earn motivation, that's not sustainable either. So really what you need is a mix of all these types of users. And favorite quote ever is, show me the incentives, I'll show you the outcome. Like really what this comes down to is the incentive design. So if you create incentive structures that only cater towards people who want to only extract in the game, that's probably not going to be a very sustainable ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But what's great inside the pixels right now is we have different types of users and there are users who just like the game and they just want to farm and they just mm -hmm. want to like go and socialize, hang out with friends too. So I would say those are the users that we want to start creating more incentives to like convert into the long run. And that's the kind of user that's probably like the ideal user in the long run too. But yeah, there's like a different mix. Someone that's coming in just with the earned motivation, it's not necessarily a bad thing. You actually kind of lean into that a little bit. But the issue is like, you, know, you can't have your entire user base be like that either. I mean, again, it comes back to this, is the struggle worth it? <laughs> On-chain gaming, is it's just not, it's not simple, but the opportunity is large. Obviously a big part, just to finish up the conversation around this growth engine a big part of user acquisition also comes down to distribution and distribution really comes down to the blockchain that you build on. You guys moved from Polygon to Ronin. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you think about uh, which blockchain you're building on as a founder and what it's been like to move over to Ronin and maybe compare Polygon to Ronin? Yeah, us moving to Ronin was the single biggest difference maker in the journey of Pixels by like 10 to 100x. Without Ronin, we would not be where we're at now. And we owe a lot to them. It's been like a great mutual relationship. And I love that team. I have so much respect for all the founders there. And it's a super, super smart team. But yeah, one of the biggest issues inside the Web3 games is the cold start problem. Mm -hmm. And basically like filling in the initial network. Because in order for any of us to work, you need a network to have a network effect to you know, actually do the things you want to do inside of Web3 gaming, right? And for a long time, before we moved over to Ronin, we were getting a lot of advice from people in Web3 gaming who actually had never released or built a Web3 game. There's a lot of figure heads in the space still that you know actually don't have the experience of actually shipping a live Web3 game. And it just wasn't very helpful. Actually talking and meeting with the Ronin team, the makers of Axie Infinity, the only Web3 game that actually reached any meaningful scale. Yeah, it was really refreshing because the amount of mentorship and advice we've been able to get from them is priceless. They have stopped us from making so many mistakes that they've already tried. Again, the issues that come with having a live Web3 game, the community building, cyber prevention, all this kind of stuff, it's very genre specific inside of Web3 gaming. Really, Web2 people don't have experience with this stuff. So really, the only people that you can get these lessons from are the people that have been building it here before. And it's not understated how valuable that is. So yeah, when we're thinking about chains and what advice I give to other founders or people building the space is like one, Think about distribution. Like another ecosystem I think that's great is base because they probably have distribution, right? They have like an amazing potential funnel between Coinbase to base. And you know, that might be a great place for a lot of people to be building on too. But 
yeah, think about distribution. Like, is the chain that you're building on actually going to be helping you get new users? Because really how I view the chain to like consumer app relationship should be more like publisher to gamer, like publisher to app relationship where, you know, there should be an aligned incentive between both parties to help both ecosystems grow. We're still so early in the space where we both should want to help each other grow. And yeah, I, it's funny because like in the bear market, that wasn't really the mindset behind a lot of these chains. Yeah, they want to do like top level BD with like all these Web2 partners. Totally. And yeah, they left. Yeah. And yeah, they weren't really thinking about growing the Web3 native communities. I think that's how this space grows. I think Web3 grows by Web3 experiences becoming better and hyper competitive against Web2 experiences rather than the top down approach again of like bringing in the Web2 partners mm-hmm. to try to funnel them in. Yeah. Well, especially right now when, as you've said, there's no playbook, right? There's no game that you can point to and be like, yeah, that is the playbook for an on-chain game. And I don't think there, I mean, we we'll actually want to talk about how you guys have this ultimate vision to build a platform and build Pixels the game. So we'll get to that in a minute. What that means is you need to build right now very much for the current users not for the users of, I mean, we saw it in the last bull run, how many large IP brands entered the space thinking they would build, whether it be a game or whatever it was, an NFT collection or something, thinking they would build and all oh, the users would just come. And you realize how quickly do your users even care about on-chain? Do they want that? You know, And if they don't value that, then it doesn't matter. And you know, Starbucks left and all these different enterprise companies are you know, they're taking off because they're just not seeing the return yet. And that's where you need that more startup mindset. Yeah. I mean, I think the question people should be asking is like, what is the Web3 actually doing for me? Because why go through the pain and suffering of adding Web3 if it's not actually doing anything for you? If you're just saying it's Web3 to have it be Web3, like, is it actually providing tangible value to me or my users? And is it so much value? It's like 10x compared to anything in Web2 <laughs> that it's like irresistible to do it basically. Do you think every game should be on chain eventually? I don't think fully on chain completely matters to be completely honest. I think there's a genre of game that is fully on chain that makes sense. But having a game fully on chain also brings in a lot of issues too. Like it's so much easier to bot a fully on chain game because by nature, a fully on chain game kind of has to be bottable. Because that's how you interact with the game, right? So I think like a genre of like autonomous worlds or like some kind of like speculation type game like i think that makes a lot of sense to be fully on chain and i think there's gonna be some interesting stuff that pops around that or like esport type thing i've seen some people make like this mix of like gamble fi with like spectator sports it's interesting not what i would be building but uh, i think there's like room for stuff like that we had a lot more on chain at one point we had like basically every single in-game action on chain like one day it broke and our users didn't even know this and that kind of is a wake-up call where it's like, okay, no one actually cares in our community if yeah. everything's fully on-chain. There's like a few tangible things they really care about, but like having everything on-chain wasn't so important to them. Very interesting. And that's something that, yeah, you, you could only learn that by building the way that you're building. Okay, I want to talk about your business model for a second here. Tell us about, you mentioned earlier, uh, you to walked us through these conversion rates. This is super interesting. Tell us a little bit about, give us an overview of the business model. And if you're comfortable telling us, are you guys profitable right now? How are things looking at this current moment? Yeah. So what I'll say right now is we're more concerned with the mission of seeing if we can make play to earn work Mm -hmm. than anything else. That's our main KPI. So for us, what that looks like is can we create an ecosystem in the long run that has net pixel spend every single month? And that might mean still distributing back some of that pixel in the form of like more UA, but really that's where we're kind of working towards. So we're at a like decent starting point. Not completely sure the exact, exact numbers, but it looks like in the last 30 days, we've either had like spent or locked up about like 7 million pixel. And then we gave out about like 16 million pixels. So there's still a deficit of about 9 million pixel that we need to make up. But it actually seems pretty reasonable for us to get there. And that's kind of the end goal, essentially. Like, can we start to token used as much as it's getting distributed back to the users? And mm-hmm. we'll see that to me, that's the real unlock. So, you know, that's the main focus over the next however long it takes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ideal timeline is like 12 months, essentially. But in order to do that, there's a lot of stuff that needs to happen. We need to basically fine tune our reward system make sure that we're like more efficient with reward distributions. We're giving it to like users who are more likely to be using it in the long run. 
we need to start introducing like new monetization inside of the game as well too. Right now, for example, like really the only thing that you can spend pixel on is the VIP pass and then like right. do it in some pets every now and then. We'll start to introduce more monetization that feels more like a free to play game. What you don't want to do is cap whale spend. And right now, like if people want to spend more in the game, they can't really do that. So we'll start introducing more of the free to play monetization mechanics inside of the game as well too and see what that does. So there's like a few things to work in there. The idea is like we want to vertically scale. We want to figure it out inside of this game. And then, you know, once we have a good idea of vertical scale, we like get that deficit a bit smaller, then it's also starting to do horizontal scaling too. So mm-hmm. we can start to take some of these same UA methods that we have and, you know, plug them in other games as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you perfectly queuing up my next question here is I want to talk about pixels, the capsule, pixels, the game, excuse me versus pixels the platform how, how do you think about that and are, are there other games that are being built on the platform right now or is it just pixels and what's sort of the vision and the maybe gets an idea of the timelines yeah yeah we're just not planting the seeds of other games that will be releasing so i would say the timeline around that is like six to 12 months before you start seeing something else from us but yeah the idea is we're building out a lot of core tech around you know, user segmentation, incentive design, rewards, and you know, also the attribution with that too. Like things that will allow us to effectively analyze like how effective the reward that we gave to a user was and mm-hmm. what that effect of that. And once we have some of this built, if we can start to bring it into other games that we build out too, that's when things start to get really interesting for us. So the idea is like prove it vertically and go yeah. horizontally. Will you be a single publisher where you're only publishing your own games or would you allow others to come in and would you open source your platform and allow others to use it? Or would you have some sort of business model where they pay you a fee? How does that look? Do you think? Yeah, we've even had like initial conversations with other games and like what it would look like if they use the pixel token. Right. To be honest, our best shot right now is because we just have so many of these skills and almost like this insider knowledge of building Web3 games out right now it's easier for us to build our own games than coach somebody else on what they need to do to succeed Mm -hmm. in the space right now. Like I would honestly rather just go acquisition route than publisher route, Mm -hmm. have it all under our umbrella in tech. Yeah, 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 really interesting. It's amazing to me to hear you say you've been working on this for a few years now and you're already one of the smartest in the room around Web3 Gaming. And I know you're not tuning your own horn when you say that. I'm going to give you the credit here. I just always think it's amazing in our space how fast things move and to step back and realize you're like, holy shit, like we've only been doing this for a few years, but we're probably the leaders because nobody else has been doing this for that long. I mean, yeah, sure, Axie is probably the one that's been going on for a little bit longer, but it really always points out to me the opportunity in this space is massive. And for anybody that's listening, if you're thinking about building on chain, you might feel like, oh, I'm too late to the party. All the big players are already here. No, no, no. We're just getting started. The opportunity is massive. And there is, as you said at the beginning of the episode, there's so much open ocean that's just available to anybody who wants to jump in and get in this. Yeah, there is a lot of room for new entrants as well. Say it's funny because you saw these games get funded like two or three years ago on the bull rod. Mm-hmm. Where are they? That's interesting because like, yeah, you would have thought that you're a little bit late, but the reality is like a lot of people got funding before. They're never going to enter the market. So it's honestly even like a better time to start entering now too. If like mm-hmm. it's an interesting thing to you, if you think that there's some merit in what we're saying about Web3 gaming, I welcome more people in. I, it's more people to bounce ideas off of. It's like not a very competitive space right now. So there's some fun stuff with that too, where most of the founders, like they all work together. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm talking to like most other Web3 gaming founders right now. We're like more than happy to share what we find with other games because yeah, the space getting better and more legitimate helps us all. We can make us look better. Like we're all pretty sick of scam projects and mm-hmm. bad actors in the space. And we just want to see better quality games in the space. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just helps all of us if there's more quality out there. Amen, brother. Amen. Preach. It's what, it's what we want here too at Milk Road. So I appreciate that. Okay, I want to talk about tokenomics for a minute. I've heard you say before that a lot of people launch tokens too early because it's easy, but building out the tokenomics right is the hard part. What, why do you think people launch tokens too early? And what are your thoughts around how you should approach tokenomics? Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing with why people were launching NFTs before they had any roadmap, any product. <laughs> like sometimes, 
yeah, people see an opportunity and that's when the grip starts to come out. So yeah, right now it's the token meta and like Web3 gaming tokens are even like a new meta now too. So you're going to see some more bad actors come into the space, which is the unfortunate part about this space where some of these people probably never actually have an intention to build a good legitimate game, which is, Mm -hmm. yeah, really hard to say that. But there is probably people like that out there. And people need to be careful with this kind of stuff. But also, even just like if there are good intentions, like stuff just happens too. Yeah, you might have the perfect roadmap, but actually executing on the roadmap is not so easy. Mm -hmm. That's like a normal thing with anything new or anything innovative, right? Like people fail and you need to give some people grace that they fail because Mm -hmm. there are a lot of people that legitimately tried and it's like it's completely understandable if things don't work out. Pixels almost didn't work out a couple of times. Like that's just how things go. It hasn't always been smooth sailing for us. There are a lot of people that didn't believe in us for a very long time, even not that long ago. Mm-hmm. Like six, seven months ago, we were having a really hard time getting people to believe in what we were doing. It's funny now, but yeah, that's how it goes, right? So one of the really challenging parts of this space is how much you're impacted by the markets and things that are external, things that are completely out of your control. You know, six, seven months ago, we were still in the bear market. We were coming out of the bear market and things were coming up, but the sentiment was definitely still there. You know, now sentiment is strong again and that impacts you so much. So it's, I I don't envy you having to manage that as well. I mean, I always love the line, that running a on-chain business is like running a public company and running a startup at the same time. It's so true because you just have way more things to think about than a typical startup would have. I want to talk a little bit about your tokenomics. I know you spent a lot of you've spent a lot of time thinking about tokenomics. You built out tokenomics early with Barry. You sort of had like this test run with Barry. What are the key factors when you think about your tokenomics that you're aiming to achieve? Yeah, so the economics are important and the game design is important too. What we found is actually simplifying tokenomics makes it 100 times easier and more manageable. And the more complicated it is, then the less likely it is to succeed. Really, for me, tokenomics, it's not so complicated. There's two things I think about when I think about tokenomics now. It's one, how are we distributing the token? And then two, what's it do? What's it do is easy. It's an in-game currency. And it's kind of akin to like a hard currency inside of a game like Clash of Clans, where it gets you like premium upgrades, it like speeds up build times. It's like not required for gameplay, but it makes the gameplay better. And then like if you build a game that monetizes like a Web2 game, but use a token, like, you know, you have that part figured out, right? You need a fun game that uses a token and you have one half the equation already done. So then two, the distribution side, again, simpler, this is better. Like we in Barry had... Like the token very tightly integrated into like the game loop we had as a soft currency. That meant the way that we had to control the token was like through all these crazy things like changing crop growth times and like the amount of energy crop used and like this kind of stuff. For Pixel, we we're just like, let's make this so much simpler. Mm-hmm. We just have a set amount of Pixel that we give out every single month and we just figure out who to give it to. So yeah, that's a lot of us in the system of the task force that we created where the uh, amount of Pixel that we get to distribute back to users the same every single month. And then really it's up to us to like basically distribute it the most efficient way, which basically means just figuring out who our best users are mm-hmm. and then giving it to them. Mm-hmm. Easier said than done, I'm sure. I want to talk about your thoughts on some other, some of your competitors, whether they be on-chain games or Web2 games. I know you follow Zynga really closely, obviously Behemoth and one of the leaders in the casual gaming space. What are you paying attention to in gaming right now who are you paying attention to who are you learning from on the web 2 side i am really obsessed with scopely lately and like i am always like a huge fan of zynga's origin story too and their approach to company building zynga was really inspirational to me mm-hmm. where you know they kind of cracked like a new method of growing games obviously utilizing utilizing facebook and social and you know they started by really putting time and energy into one game yo build was the one that like really took off i think that was actually their second game though but yeah, they like built a couple of games really early on. They spent like a lot of time on their first couple of games, learning basically the best user acquisition strategies, learning like the fine tuning of like retention, optimization, all of this kind of stuff. Like basically figuring out their own growth strategies and then also building out like engine. But they actually reused their engine in like multiple games as well, too. And then they started building tons of games. They started acting like a bit like a publisher, too. But like that journey to company building has been like pretty inspirational because I think that's how you make it work. 
even in like our case too, you got focused on like your core value add for the early stages. Mm-hmm. Uh, focus on one game, don't get too distracted. And then once you start to crack some stuff, that's when you start to scale with other games as well too. And then Scopely is a behemoth and like everything they do, I think is amazing when it comes to the user acquisition side and kind of the science behind how to make a gaming business actually work as best as it can. It's really interesting stuff what they do there and just their approach to like how they decide what games to move forward with, how they view user acquisition, how they view monetization. There's a lot that you can learn from them there. There can also obviously be some criticisms of how they you know make games too. But you know you can't argue with the business behind it. It's very effective. Yeah, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. There's lots to learn from the incumbents, even though they might not be on chain. Okay, before we wrap up here, I just want to ask, what are your thoughts on where gaming is right now on chain versus where it might be towards the end of this bull run and we don't need to give a time frame to, to that but you know where it might be in the next 6 12 18 months because i think we've all talked so much about and when i say we i mean every everybody that's been in the crypto space for a while about gaming you know hey it's going to have its moment i feel like the last bull run i talked about gaming being the biggest thing that was going to onboard people and i was wrong it wasn't the biggest thing yet and it feels like gaming is now at an inflection point. It's growing at rapid pace on chain. Where do you see it now and where do you think it'll be? Yeah, so gaming in general is in a trickier spot than most people realize when it mm-hmm. comes to the wet two side of things, where really there's only a few incumbents that are actually doing well inside of web two gaming. And it's the Scopely's, the Zingas, that are monetizing well. New games and smaller studios are actually having a very, very difficult time. You do a lot of changes in ad tracking, specifically on iPhones, the at t changes. It's just made the economics of free-to-play gaming actually extremely difficult. So Web3 gaming, Web2 gaming, I think are going to be a lot more intertwined because Web3 gaming is finally this new user acquisition model that kind of disrupts the Web2 games. So I know where we're at, that kind of, you know, talk about that. But I think, you know, where I'm seeing where Pixels is, I think we're still like about like 12 to like 18 months from like true disruption of one mm-hmm. of these industries. It's, there's still a lot of work that we need to do to actually pull off what we're trying to pull off. And if we do, then there's some really interesting stuff. But yeah, I think Web3 Gaming is going to be just gaming at some point. I still say Web3 Gaming. I'm getting feedback that maybe that's not the right way to call it. I don't even know if you need to like lead in with like the crypto parts of crypto gaming or Web3 Gaming. Like Honestly, I think Play the Earn is the primitive here that is the most appealing and like the thing that matters most. Mm-hmm. To me, that's the new user acquisition method. Essentially, how do you throw bottoms up and disrupt industry like that. But yeah, I mean, I think it's the future of gaming. I think that's where a lot of gaming, like it's the next evolution after free-to-play is going to be. Knowing where we're at, we're doing a lot of interesting stuff right now. It's a really good start. We still have a lot of work to do on our end. And I know that they're, we're kind of early entry into the market still, right? So there might be some games that pop up in the meantime between us too. But we'll still continue to grow. But I don't think we start taking like significant revenue share away from like these giants until mm-hmm. a little bit Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting take. Luke, just incredible to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. Before we wrap and let you go, I just want to give you a chance to tell our users where they can play Pixels if they're not already playing it, any ways that they can follow you or follow the team and get involved in everything you guys are up to. Yeah, I mean, go check out our website, pixels.xyz, or you can go to play.pixels.xyz to jump in. You don't need the crypto wallet to sign up, but yeah, we're on the Ronin chain. If you want to follow us on Twitter, that's where we do a lot of our messaging. We do weekly AMAs. We hang out with the community a ton. Our Twitter is at pixels underscore online. Or our Discord server is actually quite lively too. It's discord.gg slash pixels. Sweet. We'll put all the links that you just mentioned in the show notes as well. So everybody can get involved in Pixels. Luke, thanks so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Excited to watch the progress of Pixels. I think uh, that disruption that you mentioned is coming for sure. And Web3 Gaming won't just, it'll just be gaming in the future. So I look forward to that day. Well, yeah, thanks so much for having me, man. This is a good one. Awesome. Have a good one, everybody. Thanks for listening in. 
Thank you for listening to Milk Road Radio, the easiest path to get smarter about crypto. If you like this episode, share it and hit subscribe or follow so you don't miss out on the next one. There's also a link in the description to our free five-minute daily newsletter where we simplify crypto for you while making you laugh. And if you're willing to step up your crypto investing game, then we'll leave a link to Milk Road Pro as well, your number one resource to help you invest successfully in crypto. One final note, this podcast is for educational purposes is only and nothing we say is financial advice. Crypto is risky, so you should never invest more than you're willing to lose. Thank you, friends, and we'll see you in the next one.